Praise God. Well, hello. Um, you know, we are on our series of um, Romans. You know, right now, our church, we're going through this series of Romans. We've been rolling in Romans for a while now. And uh, this weekend, we have come now to Romans chapter 9. Now, how many of you have actually read Romans chapter 9 before you came here? You were curious, you were wondering what it was. Okay, we've got some holy and righteous people right here. The rest of you will pray for you afterwards. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm playing, all right? Uh, but Romans chapter 9, it is a somewhat controversial or rather difficult passage to um, look at, all right? So um, I'm going to look, just read you one, pa- read you two verses now, it's a long chapter, okay? If, I, if you want to read, uh, you'll read it on your own time. I encourage you to do that. But we'll look at some of the issues that Romans chapter 9 presents uh, this afternoon, all right? Now, let's just look at Romans 9, verses 20 to 21. If you have your Bibles, uh, why don't you go there right now? Now, it says this. No, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, Why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have a right to use the same lump of clay to make one a jar for decoration and another to throw garbage in two? Pretty strong words, right? I I was going to say, ask your neighbor whether he thinks it's a jar of decoration or garbage, but I wouldn't do that. That would be really awkward, right? But this is pretty strong words here. So the title of my sermon this afternoon, I want to speak to you for about six hours. Just seeing whether you're still awake. I want to speak to you really shortly about the thought of, that's the clay, or rather the clay has no say. With a question mark. The clay has no say. Does the clay have no say? And let me break it down to you what the main issue is here. The main issue is divine sovereignty or free will, human responsibility. Now, yesterday, some people, you know, were complaining to me, uh, we don't know what sovereignty means. It's a pretty big word. You know? So, but let me just, I know most of you are really intelligent, right? but just for the sake of the rest, you know, for the rest of us as those listening online, let me tell you what that means. Now, divine sovereignty is the belief, right, that God is absolutely powerful. He's in control of everything. He knows everything from the beginning to the end. And, you know, He's all-powerful, omnipresent, uh, omniscient, and omnipotent. But then, He also has a will that cannot be resisted. Meaning, if God wants something to be done, then it has to be done. Like, you know, if uh, nothing that we can do can change, um, you know, can change that. Then, of course, there is human responsibility, meaning that God has given us a free will. So, we actually have the option to respond or reject God in the things that we do. Now, see, if we, you know, if we, if we think about this, we can get ourselves into a, what I call, theological bind or a theological conundrum. Another big word for you right there, right? Because we're thinking to ourselves, if God really destined everything to be a certain way, what if God only created certain people to be saved and certain people not to be saved, right? Because, like, it's, it's because how, how can a human being, if God is all-powerful, reject God? Like, if somehow we were given the will to reject God, that would make Him not powerful, all right? Are you confused yet? You know, or, or it's like, you know, if God, if, if the, if God is, is fully in control, why should we pray? Because, you know, isn't God already in control? Doesn't He already decide, hasn't He already decided what should happen and what shouldn't happen? Why are we? Why should the clay bother saying anything to the porter? All right? Now, that's, these are some of the issues that uh, we're going to talk about. But before I go to my first point, let's look at the Bible, all right? Romans 9, verses 9 to 16. Now, God said this, I will return about this time next year, and Sarah has, will have a son. This son was our ancestor, Isaac. When he married Rebekah, she gave birth to twins. But before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that God chooses people according to His own purposes. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son. In the words of the scriptures, I love Jacob, but I rejected Esau. Some versions, if you have an NIV, it says, but I hated Esau. Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. 
Verse 14, are we saying then that God was unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. All right, pretty strong words once again. All right, and but my first point that I want to bring to you this afternoon is God ruthlessly perfects those whom He royally elects, or God perfects those who He selects. If you want it a bit shorter, and you know, when we, when when we talk about the idea of being chosen, of being selected. We often think of the idea of the favor, right? Or a preference, a preference, right? It's kind of like going to a buffet. Uh, you know, buffet, how many of you believe buffets are evil? It's like you, you, go, you go to a buffet, you just feel like you need to eat everything, right? You just, because like I already paid for it, you know, I can't go anymore, but I'm just going to stuff it in there, right? And you know, when you go to a buffet, you would always go, um, you know, I, 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 I always go to the dessert line. Anybody like that? I will inspect the dessert line and then I will choose or I'm going to predestine this cake you know, to, end, you know, to, uh, to, to go onto my cake and it will end up in my stomach later. So we think of preference. We think of uh, favor. Or maybe, you know, even in a, in, in, uh, in a real life situation, in our jobs or our schools, if someone gets chosen, they get chosen because they have favor or they are preferred um, compared to everyone else for a certain position. But let me give you the biblical definition of what chosen means, all right? You ready for this? Chosen means blessing, yes, but it also means testing. It's not just blessing, but along with it comes testing. You don't believe me? All right, let's do a bit of case study, all right? We've got Jacob and we've got Esau. Now, I don't know whether you know the story of Jacob and Esau, but let me do a bit of throwback and refresh your memory. Now, Jacob and Esau were twins. The Bible actually says that Jacob was born grasping the heel of Esau, and therefore he was given the name Jacob because that is symbolic for the term deceiver, right? So it was almost like that was spoken over his life, that he would be a deceiver. And the Bible said that Esau was favored by his dad, Isaac, because he was manly, you know, he had a lot of hair and he hunted and all that kind of stuff. So Isaac was like, yeah, I like this, that's my boy, all right? He hunts and all that. But then Jacob, the Bible says, was quiet and had a soft personality. So he was a bit of a nerd, you know, and, and Isaac was just like, nah, you know, you know like I, I, I want my son to be manly. So from the get-go, Isaac and Esau were already rivals as brothers, right? Sibling rivalry, pretty common. And the Bible tells us that Jacob has an interesting life. The Bible did say that Jacob was chosen, he was selected. But let me tell you something, this, the one thing that he didn't have was an easy life. If you, thought, if you think your life is complicated, man, wait till you see Jacob, all right? Because first he, um, you know, first, he gets into trouble because one day his brother comes back. His brother is pretty hungry. You know, his brother was out hunting, doing manly stuff. I don't know, bench pressing some rocks. I don't know, whatever. He was just doing, doing his thing, right? He came back. He was really hungry, and Jacob was cooking. And Jacob had, a, you know, he was cooking some stew. And, I, you know, and Esau came in, and he was like, give me that food, all right? He was hangry, hungry and angry, right? He was hangry. He was impatient. And Jacob said to him, I will give you this bowl if you would give me your inheritance. And, and you know, Esau, because he was so hungry, he couldn't, you know, he, he couldn't think properly. He was controlled by his flesh. Something for us to think about. He was controlled for his flesh. So in a moment of weakness, you know, in a moment of temporary weakness, he gave up something eternal, his inheritance. So he gave it up. And then that was not the end of it. And one day, you know, Isaac was dying. He was on his deathbed. And, you know, um, and, and he was, Isaac wanted to bless Esau. So Jacob pretended to be Esau. He, you know, he, he, he wore like this wig made, made out of animal fur to pretend to be Esau. And then when Esau found out, you know, um, he got mad and he was cast out. He was exiled. But it didn't get any less complicated there. So Jacob went to, you know, his um, uncle Laban. You know, he worked for him. And then he saw Laban's daughters, right, Leah and Rachel. Now, this is where it messes me up, right? He saw Leah and Rachel, and he was like, I like Rachel. So he told Laban, you know, hey, you know, I like your daughter. I want to marry her. So Laban was like, cool, no problem. We can have a deal. 
how about you work for me for seven years and then I'll give you Rachel. Does this sound familiar to you, this story? And then what happened was he worked seven years and this is where I, I can't comprehend this, all right? He, he wakes up the next day after working for seven years and going through the wedding ceremony. He wakes up, he finds out he married the wrong sister. Anybody been there before? Don't put your hand up, all right? You married the wrong sister. And get this, he, 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 you know, if it were me, I, would like, I was like, okay, that's, that's enough, seven years. But he's like, no, no, I like this Rachel, I like this girl. I'm going to work another seven years for you. Then you give me your daughter, Rachel. Man, how many of you know one woman is enough? Can all the men say amen, all right? One woman, man, two women, one woman is enough trouble. You don't need another one in your life, right? So he, so he got two now. Yeah, he, he's got two now. And, and, and after that, you know, like Leah and Rachel, they, they, they were fighting. Talk about a messy, a messy a family situation. You know, they were, they, they were fighting and all, and all that kind of stuff. And one day, you know, God actually blessed Isaac, uh, or rather Jacob, even more. And that caused um, Laban's sons, other sons, to be jealous of him. So he had to run away. And where could Jacob go? You know, he, he had nowhere to go. He could only go back home to face his brother Esau. So when he went back to meet his brother Esau, he actually had to kind of like crawl back and say sorry and apologize. He had to give Lots of things to be to make it a peace offering. And then we know this is in Genesis 32. Right? I just summarized about six or seven chapters of stories for you. In Genesis 32, after that, Jacob actually wrestles with God. You remember this story? He wrestles with God, and as a result of that, his hip is dislocated. And God says this to him, because you have wrestled with God and with men, you know, you have Prevail. And this day, I'm changing your name from Jacob, from deceiver, to Israel. How many of you know sometimes the greatest struggles in life can lead to your most powerful encounter? Amen. And chosen means blessing plus testing. And Jacob was chosen, but he was tested. And if we were to look at this in context, Romans chapter 9 talks about the nation of Israel. Now, if we were to talk about, now I'm, I'm not a big expert on Israel, you know, but you know, if you think about it, let's just think about it for a moment. The nation of Israel is one of the most, um, cha- you know, one of the most, um, one of the nations that's gone through the biggest or the most trials in history. You know, they survived the Holocaust. In fact, where the country is, if you look in the map, now I did a bit of research, right, a bit of geography, right? Where Israel is, you know, it is like the worst place in the world to set up a country. Like the worst territory because you got you got a sea in front of you and then on your left and on your right and behind you, you've got other nations all surrounding you. You are like 24-7 under siege. And it is said that actually that patch of land is meant to be the less fertile. But do you know that in that region, Israel is actually the most prosperous? And you know, I, was, I, was, I was looking through this as well that um, apparently in the top 50, in Forbes' top 50 uh, or 50 billionaires in the world, 10 of them are Jews. So the people, the Jewish people, though they were chosen, but they, were also, they are also tested. So I want us to get this into our head, that just because we are chosen, or, or if, if you're like, how come, you know, some people are chosen, some people are not. Hey, yeah, if you want to be chosen by God, guess what? He is going to perfect you. He's going to mold you. He's going to shape you. And this is what the Bible says as well, 1 Peter 4. And I'm going to, so this afternoon, I'm going to read you lots of Bible. Is that okay? Is it okay to read the Bible in church, everyone? Yeah, is that okay? I'm going to read you some Bible, all right? 1 Peter 4, verses 12, 16, and 19 says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. Verse 19, so if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you for He will never fail you. So that's what it means. But then we have a question. Did God really hate Esau? Did He really hate him? Because that's what the Bible says, right? But I want to tell you, I did a bit of reading, so I'm just going to put on my theological hat for a moment, or I'm just going to wear it real nice and tell you for a moment that this word hate 
the Hebrew construct actually means to not to despise completely or hate it for its own value, but to actually, um, you know, to, to actually like less, prefer less. But it doesn't mean to reject completely. It's kind of like Jesus saying that, you know, in, in Luke 14, if you want to follow me, you have to hate your, you know, your father, your mother, your wife, and your children, right? You know, I tell the youth this, right? whenever I preach that, don't go home and say, mommy, daddy, I hate you, right? That's what the Bible says, right? Because that's what law it means. And Jesus also talks about how, if, you know, if your left hand sins and if you, you know, cut it off, if your right eye sins, gorge it out. How many of you have actually took that literally? We don't, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a figure of speech, a hyperbole, right? Saying that to emphasize a point. So did God really hate es- Esau? You know, let me show you what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 23. It says this, verses 7 to 8. This is, you know, uh, this is a commandment to the Israelites. Do not detest the Edomites or the Egyptians because the Edomites are your relatives and you lived as foreigners among the Egyptians. Isn't that amazing? That God says, don't, you know, don't, don't just hate them and don't hate the people who held you captive as well. The third generation of Edomites and Egyptians may enter the assembly of the Lord. Now you are sitting here and you are extremely theological. So you would now quote Obadiah chapter 1 verse 10 to me. In case you didn't know, it's a book of Obadiah, right? Obadiah, you, you say no, but God said in Obadiah 1.10 that, you know, that he hates Esau and he will reject them forever. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because let me tell you, there is a reason for that. Now you see, I was talking, I was telling you about Jacob and Esau before. You know, Jacob went back, made a peace offering with Esau, and they settled their differences. The only person, the, only, the people that didn't settle that was the descendants of Esau. Now, whose fault was that? That's not, not for us to debate. But regard, you know, needless to say, the, the Edomites, which are descendants of Esau, they actually persecuted and they hated the nation of Israel. So it was their persistence in their hate their unforgiveness that caused God to reject them because that's what the Bible says, that they weren't, they weren't rejected, right? Even though God preferred Jacob over Esau, but he didn't, he didn't reject Esau and the Edomites. He said they could come in into the assembly. But what did they do? They chose not to. So that's my first point. Now, my second point, I want to address now the issue of divine sovereignty or human responsibility. Which one is it? Now we're going to look at the Bible again, all right? Romans 9, verses 17 to 19. Scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to some and He chooses to harden harden the hearts of others so they refuse to listen. Well then, you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what He makes them to do? Pretty strong words and a pretty, pretty, um, a big, it's, it's a big issue, isn't it? Well, before we, now we're going to do, we're going to do a case study of Pharaoh. So we did a case study of Jacob and Esau. Now let's look at um, Pharaoh. Now we know the story of Pharaoh and, and Moses and Aaron. So Moses was appointed, you know, by God to go to, at this point of time, the Israelites were held captive in Egypt and they lived as slaves. So God appointed Moses to go and talk to Pharaoh, right? You know, so he would go to Pharaoh and he would tell them, look, you know, you got to let my people go and all that kind of stuff. So this is what happens in Exodus 3, all right? So I'm going to show you case study. Did God really harden Pharaoh's heart? Now Exodus 3, verse 19. God says this, he says, he says, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. And God already knew that Pharaoh was going to harden his heart. But let's move on and let's see. So fast forward now to Exodus 5, right, verses 1 and 2. All right, let's get the slide up. After this presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him this. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Or in other words, let my people go so that they can go and worship me, right? 
But listen to what Pharaoh says. Is that so? Retorted Pharaoh. Is that so? And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Reminds me of Galatians 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived, my friends. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So let's go, Exodus 7, right? So now Moses and, you know, Moses and, and, and Aaron are like, okay, now we got a problem. Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh could have said, oh, let's talk about this. Let's discuss the terms, you know, would it be a progressive thing, a gradual thing, right? But, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about it. But no, he said flat out no. So God had to send signs to convince Pharaoh. But then, you know, Moses and Aaron, um, you know, they, they, they brought, they went to Pharaoh, did what the Lord had commanded. He threw his staff down. And he became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and sorcerers. And these Egyptian magicians did the same thing. They threw down their staff, which also became serpents. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up theirs. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard. He refused to listen, just as the Lord has predicted. Now let's go Exodus 8. So the Pharaoh's magicians tried. So right now, right, another plague has come upon Egypt. Pharaoh's magicians tried to do the same thing, but they couldn't. And they told Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Let's just, you know, let's just give up, right? But Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He wouldn't listen to them just as the Lord had predicted. And then now only we see in verse, in chapter 9, the magicians were unable to stand before Moses because the bowels had broken out of them and all the magicians, the Lord, but the Lord had hardened Pharaoh's heart. And just as the Lord had predicted to Moses, Pharaoh just refused to listen. And then let's go another, just a little bit more in Exodus 9. Pharaoh, you know, right now Pharaoh came to his senses. He was like, okay, okay, this time I have sinned. The Lord is the righteous one and my people and I are wrong. Please beg the Lord to end this terrifying thunder and hail. We've had enough. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer, right? But so Moses left Pharaoh's court and went out of the city. He lifted his hands up to the Lord. The thunder and hail stopped and the downpour ceased. But oh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, my dear Pharaoh, look at that, verse 34. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail, thunder stopped, he had his official sin again and Pharaoh again became stubborn because his heart was hard. Pharaoh refused to let the people go. Can I tell you, just from this short case study of Pharaoh, can I suggest to you that the person who first hardened their heart was Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He could have said, all right, let them go, all right, it's fine, let's discuss it, let's talk about it. But he, he didn't just refuse, he decided to mock God. And not only that, he said, okay, since you asked them to be released, now they have to make the same amount of bricks, but this time they go find their own straws. Look at the attitude of Pharaoh. And, and, and we can debate about this, we can say, well, it's because God knew that his heart would be hard because God already made him hard. But I want to suggest to you that, you know, we have to read the whole Bible. Now, if we had Romans 9, that would seem, if only had Romans 9 in the whole Bible, that seems like the case. But we have the whole Bible, the rest of the Bible. Look at what the rest of the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8. Don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts. And verse 12, be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God, right? Don't be deceived by sin and harden against God. Ephesians 4 says this, verse 18, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they had closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. Proverbs 28, 14, blessed is the man who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. And this is where, you know, it comes, well, this is the conclusion. Romans 1, verse 24, therefore, God gave them over to their sinful 
desires of their hearts, gave them over. Can I suggest to you, my friends, and can I suggest that we pray for even the people that we know, if you harden your heart, harden your heart to the point where God gives you over, you are in big trouble. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. And we have to pray for people, you know, don't, that they were softened, that their hearts were softened. Don't harden your heart in trials. Don't harden your heart when you don't understand. Don't harden your heart when things become difficult because that is not what God wants. So the, uh, the question is, is it divine sovereignty or is it human responsibility? And I will, ask, I will answer that by, by asking you this. Now, I've got, a, I've got a coin here, a 50 cent Australian. Anybody want this? Two ringgit, right? It's about two ringgit right here. Now, this is the head of the coin and it's tails. Which part of the coin is the coin? The head or the tail? Both. So in the same way, is it divine, is it divine sovereignty or human responsibility? Can I tell you? It is both, that it is intention, that it's not just one or the other, it is both. And you know, if, and some people believe that divine sovereignty, if you're chosen by God, you will, never, you will never struggle, you will never sin, you will just be like perfect, you'll be like a super Christian. But let me tell you what the Bible says, Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 10, it says this, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Look at that. Make every effort. So it's, just, it's not just God doing it all. It's us and God. Salvation is what God does, but sanctification is what we do with God, that we have to partner with Him. Now, you know, now I, I, I want to take, take a side note and talk about, maybe you have a question that, well, should we pray? Why should we pray? If, you know, can, can prayer actually change things? Because if God is sovereign, if He already knows, where does human responsibility come in, right? Let's do another case study. You know, it's an afternoon of case studies. You remember this story of um, Abraham praying for Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18? So what happened was God told Abraham, hey, Abraham, I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah because I just had enough of that place. And Abraham was thinking to himself, but his relative Lot was there and he was worried, right? So he was like, God had already set out to do something. So Abraham said, okay, um, hey, hey God, I know, I know it's not my place to say, but how about if, how about if, 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 if you find 50 righteous people there, you spare the city. How about that? And, and God's like, okay, sure. And Abraham was like, wow, that worked. Oh, um, but, but man, have you seen Sodom and Gomorrah? That place is bad. Right? But, so, hey, hey, God, how about 45? And God was like, sure, Abraham, okay. And he was like, wow, that was easy. How about 40? How about 35, 30? So he bargained with God. So he said, God, how about if you find five righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, you, don't, you spare the place. And God will say, okay, Abraham, because you asked of me, I will do that. Let me tell you something. We cannot twist the arm of God, but we can move his heart. We cannot twist his arm, but we can move his heart. Because James 5 verse 16 says that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Prayer works. And how, how are we made righteous? You know, what does that mean? The prayer of a righteous man. Is a righteous man a super Christian, a, whole, a extra holy person? No. What does the Bible say? You are made righteous because of your faith. Why was Abraham's prayer powerful? Because he was known as the father of faith. So it is our faith that makes us righteous and gives access to God. But can I say all of this, my friends, that a conclusion is, right, a conclusion of um, is it divine sovereignty or human responsibility? I would summarize it with this statement. The clay has a will, but the porter has his, will always have his way. That we have a will, but ultimately God will, has, will have his way. So we can sit here, my friends, and we can debate. We can debate, you know, is, is, is it this, is it that? You know, and we can say, is, is it fair for God to do this? Is it fair for God to do that and all that? We put God on trial now, but at the end, 
He is the judge. That He is the one. He is the judge. So that's why this day, don't harden your heart. Don't say, oh, you know, who is this God and all that kind of stuff. Because some of us could be carrying hardened hearts. You could come into church, you know, full of skepticism. Come into church with full of, of an attitude towards God. It's like, God, prove yourself to me and all that. But my friend, I want to tell you, you know what? I'm, I'm thinking of this verse, right? In Psalm chapter 14, it says, The fool says in his heart that there is no God. The fool says in his heart that there is no God. So don't harden your heart. But here's my last point. My last point is this. The sovereignty of God is anchored by the generosity of grace. You see, we find, you know, at the, at the end of the day, sometimes we would find that the sovereignty of God is a, is a hard pill to swallow. It's something hard to take in because we think that everything, you know, we, we, we think that, man, if, if everything's like this, you know, but things are not, are not looking well or things are not turning out the way we want it to, we begin to think, man, you know, this is unfair. But we only think that way when we don't understand the nature of God. You see, God isn't out to get us. He's out to make us, but He's not out to get us. He's not out to get us. He's not, he's not out to trick us or He's not out to punish or persecute us. But God is a gracious God. And how do I know this? Romans 9 verses 22 to 23 says this, In the same way, even though God has the right to show His anger and His power, He is very patient with those on whom His anger falls. Very patient. And you know, and, and can, I tell you, can I show you other scriptures? Ezekiel 18 verse 23. This is what God says, Do you think that I like to see wicked people die? says the Sovereign Lord, of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. First Timothy 2 says this, this is good and pleases God who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Second Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord isn't being slow about His promise as some people think. He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed but once everyone to repent. And how do I know He's gracious? I will close, I will end with this scripture, Romans 9 verses 30 to 32. Even though the Gentiles, this is the concluding um, words of chapter 9, even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God and it was by faith that this took place. So God is a gracious God, my friends. He is sovereign, He is powerful, but He is not out to get us. He is not out to trick us. And He knows what He is doing. That is why when there is no clarity in our lives, we can trust His sovereignty. When we, when we are unsure where we are going, when we are unsure about what's happening to us, when we don't understand when you, if you're looking around you and you don't understand what's happening, my friend, can I say, stop looking around you and start looking up to the one who knows what he is doing, the author and perfecter of our faith. God knows what he is doing and God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do. But that doesn't mean we should just relax and hang back and not get close to Him or draw near to Him. No, we have a part to play as well because God wants to be involved with us. He wants to journey with us. He wants a relationship with us. So my friends, this is God's sovereignty. But you know, at the end of the day, and I'll end on this, on this note, right? I was just thinking about this. I didn't say this yesterday, but I was thinking about this this morning. Which one? What will give God more glory? That if God made everyone submit to Him or He only chose certain people to know Him and certain people He rejected, would that give Him more glory? Or if He, because of His, you know, even, even though He's sovereign, because of His grace, He decides to empower us by giving us the decision that when we see the majesty and the beauty and the grace of God, we have no choice but to say, God, I, I respond to You. I receive you. Which one? What will give God more glory? And it's, it's kind of like, and, and it's, it's, it's like this as well, you know. I'm, I shared this yesterday, right? Like Pastor Chu is my boss. 
So as my boss, he has the authority over me to, you know, tell me to do what, what, um, to do whatever he wants me to do. But it is within his authority, he decides to say, John, I'm not going to make you have lunch with me. I want to invite you to come and have lunch with me. Now he chooses to say, to chooses to make it an invitation. I want you to come. I want you to come. And but he could say, no, I'm, you must come because we gotta discuss work. No, he says, I want you to come. And it kind of reminds me of Matthew chapter 22 as well, right? When Jesus talks about the parable of the wedding feast, of how you know this king he prepared this large feast for you know for for his son, a celebration. And then he, he sends his messengers out to call out everyone. You know, hey, would you come? Would you come? Would you come? But listen to what happens in this story. When his messengers go out, people actually make excuses. He make, they make reasons. They say, no, I can't go because I got to do this. I got to go here. I got to do, I got my own thing to do. Do not harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts. And then, and then the, king, the king says, well, I had it. Go and call everyone else and invite them for this feast you know this day this afternoon even as the word of God is preached I want to give an opportunity could we all just stand for a moment you've been sitting a long time could we just stand we'll finish really soon but could you just stand for a moment and in a moment we're gonna we're just gonna sing this song from the chorus but the first group of people you know I, I believe that the altar is gonna be open today you know you know what an altar call is the altar call is a call to altar, to change something. And the first group of people that I want to encourage you, I want to ask you to respond to this altar, not because I want to shame you or, or make you feel embarrassed, but because it's an opportunity to, to engage with God once again. The first group of people I want to ask to respond to the altar as a, as a song has been sung is you have hardened your heart. And Maybe, maybe you, you've come in with a skeptical attitude. Maybe you've come in with a, uh, maybe you've even, you know, you've even doubted God and, and you feel like your heart's getting hard. I want to encourage you to respond and say, God, you come to the altar and say, God, even as I take this step, I want to soften my heart. Let this step be an act of faith that God, I will soften my heart. Because you know what the Bible says? The Bible says God can actually give you, take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So that's what God can do. You don't need to do it on, it on your own, my friend. But right now, if you know that your heart is hard, if you know that there are some things in your life that you need, you need to get right with God, if you know that this, I need to respond to God and have a soft heart. And my friend, can I say this? You're not, you're not responding to me. And I'm not looking for numbers. I'm looking for people who are genuinely in need of God. So as we sing this song, if you know that's for you, why don't you come? Don't you don't wait? Why don't you just come? Why don't you just come to this altar right now? I feel like there is a person here where your heart is extremely hard, and you just feel like, and you're like, I'm not going to respond to that because that would be embarrassing. But with the grace of God, I just sense this is what's happening to you right now. Wherever you are, you don't have to lift your hand up. But I just want to encourage you. I see your heart. It's a picture, you know, if there was a picture of your heart, it's this heart that is, that, is, that is completely encompassed in solid stone. And, and you're wondering, what in the world am I doing here? You know, like, this is not for me. But I just sense right now, even as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and touching you, He's shattering that rock. And you're thinking that even as this rock, these pieces of rock is coming off, Underneath it, it's not going to be a rotten or blackened heart, but it's going to be a heart of flesh, a heart that is red, a heart that is beating, a heart that is full of life because the Holy Spirit wants to renew you. The Holy Spirit is not out to get you. Can I, can I assure you that He's not out to get you? God is not out to get you. He loves you and He wants you to have a renewed heart. In Jesus' name, thank you, God. The last group of people that I want to, I just want to give an opportunity, all right, before I get a pastor Chu or pastor Lee Chu to close, is you have, you know, you have never 
I'm just stepping out in faith, right? That you have never received Jesus, in, you have never invited rather Jesus into your heart before. And you know, maybe you've coming, you've been coming to church, and you've been, you know, you just been coming for services, um, just enjoying the experience and meeting new people, and it's all good. But you have never made a personal decision in your own heart to say, I want to receive Jesus in my life. So this is what we're going to do with every head bow and every eye closed, all right? And can I ask in this moment that movement be extremely minimal in this place so that we can give people privacy and respect um, this moment, all right? Now, if you have never received Jesus into your life before, but you are saying this day, you know, it's an invitation, my friends. It's not an obligation. It's an invitation. God is sovereign, but God is also merciful and gracious that He wants to invite you onto this journey with Him. So if you are here, you have never, you have never received Jesus into your heart before, but you would like to make a commitment today. You would like to make a commitment today. Wherever you are, can I just ask you to put your hand up with no one looking around, right? no one looking around, right? Just put your hand up and say, I've never made a decision to respond to Jesus before, but right now, I want to do it. I see that, what, that hand at the back. Thank you, ma'am. I see your hand. You can put it down. Anybody else, you have never received Jesus before. I, I see you, your hand there, sir. Thank you. I see your hand there, ma'am. Thank you. I see those hands. Anybody else, you have never made a commitment to follow Jesus and you want to do that this afternoon. You want to do that this afternoon. While anybody else, I'm just looking across the hall one more time. Wow. Wow. We've got about three people who responded and that, that is that's amazing but this is what we're going to do, okay? This is what we're going to do. Um, did, did the leader see those hands? Did the, did the leaders manage to see those hands? We're not we're not sure, right? We, we saw, we got those hands. All right, those of you who put your hands up um, just now, can I ask you, we're going to pray in a moment, but those of you who put your hands up just now, we don't want to embarrass you, but we want to come and connect with you and talk to you about the decision that you made. So could you do us a big favor and come to where the, the prayer corner is afterwards? Is that okay? Right, so this why come to this side of the stage later and, and uh, have, so that we can have a chat with you, pray with you, and I really celebrate because that's what the Bible says that there is a party in heaven when one person decides to follow Jesus even when one person praise God can we pray with them my friends can we pray with them this is what we're going to do uh, let's all pray together alright just you all repeat after me you pray out loud especially for those of you who lifted your hands up we're all going to pray so everyone's going to pray together but let's all pray and we're going to pray and ask Jesus and receive him into our lives let's all pray dear Lord Jesus, dear Lord Jesus I thank you I thank you for your grace, for your grace. I thank you I thank you that you are sovereign that you are sovereign that you are all powerful you are all powerful all knowing all knowing and yet God and yet God, you love me you love me so this day God I invite you to come into my life. I invite you to come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. Teach me. Teach me. Empower me. Empower me. To live in your ways. To live in your ways. So this day, Lord. This day, Lord. I am yours. I am yours. And you are mine. And you are mine. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God some glory, some praise in this place. my spirit as I gave the altar call to the first three services when the sovereign will of God is preached it is a good sovereign will yeah. because God is Amen. a good God Amen. so I want to open the altar in keeping what Pastor John has mentioned that any one of you who needs an affirmation in your heart you're going through a difficult patch you don't understand. But I just want to open the altar for you that even as you come forward, the affirmation of God reaches out to you regarding your present situation, regarding your family, regarding your work, regarding your career. 
I don't know. But even as you begin to respond to God, God responds to you. God is a good God. It is like that woman, you know, who goes through the crowd. She was having an issue of blood. She was impoverished. She was cheated, maybe. She was disappointed with people. And yet she still carried her problem. What she did? She went through her choice. It's her choice. And she just touched the helm of Jesus. And the Bible tells us the havil of God, the goodness of God reached out to her. And God can do the same for you. You're going to open the altar. You have to press in. That woman will not be healed if she had not pressed in in the crowds. But she chose to do that. I want to believe that even in the anointing and the presence of God, whatever your issues are, you respond. He's a good God. He wants the best for you. But strangely, you have to reach out and prefer Him. You have to prefer Him. So we're going to sing this song again. Reach out. No matter how young, how old you are, I want to believe that God has put you here in this service, in this afternoon, to hear this message, which is very different from what Pastor Samkyong mentioned. But you are here. At this time, hear this message. You reach out. You respond to His call. How old, how young, it doesn't matter. Nothing to do with age, but everything to do with your faith. Remember, He's a good so you reach out to Him. Whatever your circumstances may be, uncertainty in your career path, some obstacle, even sickness, disease, whatever it is, you respond. Like that woman, touch the helm of Jesus. Will you do that? Will you do that? Hallelujah. Oh, Ramanda, let's sing the song as we close. Amen. Respond to Him, whatever it is. Give us permission to pray with you so that you will have a breakthrough in your life. So you have clarity of direction. Whatever it is, don't harden your heart. Hallelujah. You are responding to God. You are responding to a good God. You are responding to a good God who wants good for you. That's all there is. You are safe in the house of God. Nothing is impossible with God, understand? Whatever your issue is, whatever your issue is, trust Him, trust Him. Oh, hallelujah. The Father's Whatever it is, you don't hold back. There's nothing impossible with God. Nothing impossible with God. And all that requires for you is to come and respond to Him and believe, believe that because you do that, God enters into your situation. God comes into your situation. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for the faith that we have. We believe in you. We believe in you, Lord. For our family, for our children, for our career, for our relationship, for our future. Whoa! Amen. For he is
music continues to play. Wherever you're standing, I just want you to connect with God. I don't want anybody to leave this place without being blessed. I don't want any one of you to leave this place empty-handed because God is a good God, understand? Whatever your situation may be, problems, obstacles, difficulties, in your workplace, in your career path, those of you with children and families, you are concerned for your loved one and your children. Will you surrender it to God? I don't know what your situation or what your problem is, you know, but God knows. So wherever you are standing, will you connect with God? I do this every time before I close. For what? So that every single one of you, wherever you are, connect. Connect with God. Do it. Unless you've got no problems, huh? and I doubt it. Everybody, including me, got problems. So this is your moment, your time. So wherever you are standing right now, young, old, left to the right, front to the back, you bring an issue to God right now before I pray for you. Remember, there's nothing impossible with God, you know. Because if God is for you, nobody can be against you. Remember, if God is for you, nobody can accuse you. Not your superiors, not your family members, not your siblings, not your parents, not your relatives, not your boss. Not your friend. Nobody. And remember, if God is for you, nobody can separate you from the love of God Amen. in Christ Jesus. So wherever you are, connect. Reach out. He's a good God. And His will for you is always God. Always God. Will you connect with Him? I can't do that for you. You can do it for yourself. I'm going to give you another minute before I close. Connect with Him. Connect with Him. Connect with Him. Wow. Wow. Father, you heard this cry. You heard these cries, Father Lord, that came from, from every single one. And everyone matters to you. You don't trivialize it. And I know that in the coming days and coming weeks and months, you will have the answer. And whatever the answer is, it is always for God. It is always for good. So 
So Father, in Jesus' name, I speak a blessing now upon every single person here in this hall and auditorium this afternoon. I speak a blessing upon every household they represent. Every loved one that they represent. Every family that they are part of. I speak a blessing to every member of that family. Their parents, their siblings, their loved ones. Oh, Father, I know, God, that your presence will go with them and you will never leave them. You will never forsake them. And the sovereign will of God will come upon every life for good, for good, so that the purposes of God will be fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah. You know, God is a wonderful, wonderful I can never say this enough, you know. And I, when I say this, I really believe in it. Because I've seen the goodness of God in my own life, in the life of literally thousands of people whom I've connected with. Thousands. So thank you, Jesus, for this afternoon. In fact, thank you, Jesus, for this whole weekend. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah, Father. I'm going to pray right now, not only for the people who have listened to your word in the last four services, but also for others who will listen to this word through the podcast and through the YouTube. They will reach hundreds and thousands of people across the world, actually, across the world. Bless them. So now separate us with your blessing. Bring us back safely home. Go home and bless your families. Go home, bless your families. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you this day. May the Lord make His face always to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord Turn his face, turn his face to you all the time and grant you shalom. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Let's give God a clap offering.